As you probably know by now, aviation is really safe and airplanes are really safe. But one thing that keeps accidents happening is us, the humans. About 80% of accidents are still due to human factors, or what we used to call pilot error. This is why aeronautical decision making is so important. We want to learn how to logically and systematically make some decisions, meanwhile managing the stress and assessing the risk that comes with all of our decisions. So we want to focus on the human in the cockpit. We want to look at your attitudes, your behaviors, and things that might lead you to make an unsafe decision, and then see how we can modify those behaviors and attitudes so that the safety of your flight is not compromised. In real life, if you screw up and you make a bad decision, it doesn't lead to tragedy most of the time. In aviation, the stakes are a little bit higher and the margin of error is much less. Now let's talk about risk. We as pilots tend to be goal-oriented. Say you had a couple flights and now it's your last fuel stop, you've been flying for about 8 hours and you have about an hour and a half left to fly before you get home. You're getting kind of tired, it's getting kind of late, do you go fly? Most of us, being goal-oriented, of course, would say, sure, yeah, I'm gonna go. And we have a tendency to ignore our personal limitations just to complete the mission. And as a single pilot, you don't have anyone to make decisions with, it's all on you. So do you go? So in this scenario, the risk is going flying tired. Now, it's not enough to identify the risk. We have to look at it and see how can we mitigate it. In the example that I gave, sleep seems like a really good option. But I don't want to stay in a hotel, it's way too expensive. Now, is one night in a hotel really worth your life? And unfortunately, that's what you're asking. Now, for some of you, it is worth spending the night. You'll fork up the money, you'll go stay, or you'll sleep at the FBO, whatever. Some of you will continue on, press on, and make it. And then there are some of you about who you'll read in the NTSB accident reports. The best option when you're deciding to go fly or not to go fly is to always take the most conservative approach. Even if it costs you a little bit of money, even if it delays you and maybe inconveniences you or somebody else. It's always better to live and tell the tale of how you didn't do something stupid than to do something stupid and not be able to tell the story because you're not around anymore. I know that's all morbid and negative, but that's really what you're deciding when you take a risk. Now, speaking of the NTSB reports, I highly recommend that you check them out. And by looking at those reports, maybe you'll learn that a competent pilot like yourself given the set of circumstances, could potentially end up in the same situation that the pilot in the accident did. We have risk, how do we mitigate it? One of the ways we can do that is using the I'm safe checklist. That stands for illness, medication, stress, alcohol, fatigue, and emotion. This is a good mental check to run through to see if you're fit for flight. Illness is self-explanatory. Medication. Am I taking anything that might affect my judgment or maybe make me drowsy? Usually there's a little clue on the package that says, do not operate heavy machinery. Stress. Do you have any pressure to get there? Do you have any external issues that might affect your decision making? Alcohol. Obviously it affects your judgment and you can be more susceptible to hypoxia and disorientation. Fatigue. Did you get enough rest? Are you going to be tired an hour from now when you're still flying? And fatigue is one of those insidious hazards that you might not really realize that you have until you start making serious errors. So please, please, please don't fly fatigued. Finally, emotion. Are you upset? Are you angry, depressed? Whatever it is, are you fit to fly? Now that's a personal checklist. Another checklist you can go through is the PAVE checklist, and that stands for Pilot Aircraft, Environment, and External. You're basically asking, what can hurt me, my passengers, or my airplane? The pilot, once again, is the I'm safe checklist. You run through that and make sure you're safe to fly. You can also look at your experience, your currency, your recency, are you actually fit for flight? For the aircraft, are you familiar and current with it? Does it have the equipment you need for the mission? Can it go as high as you want? Does it have enough fuel and enough reserves to get you where you're going? The V is environment. Obviously the big one is the weather. But also there are things like terrain, your safe altitudes, your maximum elevations along your route of flight. How's the airport? Are the lights available if you're flying in when it's dark? Did you check the NOTAMs? Do you have an alternate? On this one, people will argue left and right about, well, I don't need an alternate, the weather is clear. Here's an example that a student and I had. We were flying into this airport, and it was a cross-country VFR day. It was clear, it was calm, it was great. And when we checked the weather about 15 minutes prior to touchdown, we learned that the airport was closed. And no, it was not in the NOTAMs before we left and it was because somebody ran their airplane off of the runway into the woods that were next to the runway. So have an alternate no matter where you're going and what the weather is. 
Finally, external pressures. Somebody waiting at the airport to pick you up when you get there. Do you want to get your passenger there? Do you not want to disappoint or maybe impress him? Since we're goal-oriented, we have this thing called get there Basically, we want to get there no matter what. And on top of that, we have a little bit of pride too, where we don't really want to disappoint anybody, and we don't want to admit that maybe we're not as qualified or as comfortable doing something that we're not supposed to be doing. And external pressures, this is the one category of risk that can make you ignore everything else. For example, you want to get home and your wife is waiting for you. The weather's starting to get bad. This is the first time you've flown the airplane and it's kind of getting dark. You're getting tired. Oh well, you're going to go fly anyway because your wife is waiting for you. That's how you get into trouble. One of the best, most practical ways to mitigate risk is to set personal minimums. I'm not just talking about like in your brain somewhere you have, well, if it's 7 miles and 3,000 overcast, that's good enough for me to go. I'm talking about actually writing it out on a piece of paper. And the FAA has this personal minimum checklist that you can fill out. And when it comes time to fly, look at it and say, this is what I've written down, that's what I'm comfortable with, and I won't break that. I'm not going to go and try to get away with something I'm not comfortable with. As you fly more and get more experience, update your personal minimums so that they reflect your current comfort level with flying. Here's a general nugget of information for life and for flying. Things usually take longer than you think they do, they cost more than you think they will, and they don't go according to plan. So if you can accept those things, you can accept delays, you can accept unfortunate things, and try to manage risk and not accept any more risk than you have to. Now believe it or not, the decisions we make are based on our attitudes. And in aviation, we've identified five hazardous attitudes that can change the quality of your decisions. With hazardous attitudes, what you need to do is realize that you have a problem, like the AA says, label your attitudes as hazardous, and then tell yourself the corresponding antidote. So for all five of these, you're going to have a hazardous attitude, and then what the corresponding antidote is, and that should be memorized because you will run into situations where your attitudes will try to influence your decision making and you need to tell yourself what the right thing is to do. So here are the five attitudes and see if you identify with any or all of them. The first one is anti-authority or don't tell me. These people don't like anyone telling them what to do. They see rules and regulations and procedures as unnecessary or silly or infringing on their freedoms or something like that. And the antidote for this attitude is follow the rules, they are usually right. I had a student one time when we were looking at instrument approaches and minimums in those approaches who told me that the government shouldn't be telling us what to do because it was an FAA approach plate and they shouldn't be meddling with our lives, they shouldn't tell us what to do. Okay, that's a personal opinion, that's great, but if you're flying in instrument conditions and you're buzzing treetops looking for a runway, you should probably stick to some minimums that are safe and that'll keep you safe. So follow the rules, they are usually right. Next attitude is impulsivity, or do it quickly. People with this attitude have the need to do something or anything and immediately. They don't really stop and think about the consequences or maybe some other options that are available. They feel the need to just react right away and do the first thing that comes to mind. And the antidote is not so fast, think first. Then there's invulnerability, it won't happen to me. Accidents happen, but they happen to others usually, but not me. People with this attitude don't feel like they will be personally involved in an accident or an incident. They're a lot more likely to take chances and increase the risk. And then there's macho. I can do it. These people are always trying to prove that they're better than anyone else. I'll show them or watch this. They'll try to prove themselves by taking more risk and trying to impress people. And the antidote is taking chances is foolish. Finally, we have resignation. What's the use? People with this attitude don't see themselves as being part of the solution or being able to make a difference in what happens. They think it's good luck when things are going good or that somebody's out to get them or that it's bad luck when things don't go as good. Now the antidote is, I'm not helpless, I can make a difference. Now I'm sure as you look at these, you identify with at least a couple of them. Usually that's how it goes. It's not all black and white. You're not one or the other. So I want you to memorize the attitude and the antidote and then tell yourself the antidote if you see yourself slipping into that hazardous attitude. Once again, the goal is to mitigate risk and to keep you and anybody you're flying with safe and not just to memorize a thing for a written test. Now we have a few models for decision making and problem solving. 
I'm condensing each one of these into a short few seconds, but the Pilot Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge should definitely be consulted because there's a lot more information in there. So the 5 P's model stands for Plan, Plane, Pilot, Passenger, and Programming. Each one of these things can impact your environment and force you to make a decision. Now the best decisions are made early on so they don't surprise you later. With the 5 P's model, there are 5 times where you should stop and think about the 5 P's. So before walking out to the airplane, before takeoff, about halfway through the flight, before starting the descent, and before entering the airport area. Now what I mean by all these 5 P's is, the plan is your mission, or what are you trying to do? The airplane is all the mechanical stuff going on with the airplane. The pilot, that's you, your physical, mental state. Passengers, are they pressuring you to go anywhere? Or do they not understand the risks? And then the programming, your fancy avionics, and all that goes along with that. So if you're flying, and halfway through your flight, you look at the weather ahead and it's getting bad, it's a lot easier to make a decision to go to an alternate or to find another alternate than when you get to about 20 miles outside the airport and you have to start descending and, oh wait a minute, the weather is below what I would like it to be. So that's the 5 P's model. We also have a 3 P's model. That stands for Perceive, Process, and Perform. For Perceive, you see the set of circumstances that you have. Process, you evaluate how that will impact your safety. And then Perform, you choose the best course of action. And at the end, you evaluate the whole thing. And did you make the best decision? If not, you go through the process and do it again. And this model is basically a continuous loop that you run through without really thinking about it. And then we have one of my favorites, the Decide model. This is another continuous loop that you run through, and it's a logical, critical thinking way of making aviation decisions. That stands for detect a problem, estimate the need to react, choose a course of action, identify solutions, do the actions, and evaluate the effects. The example I like to use is an engine failure in flight. Detect. You can tell the engine's not running because there's less thrust, airspeed's decreasing, RPM's decreasing, all that stuff, propeller's not spinning. Estimate the need to react. You have to react pretty quick, especially in a single engine airplane. Choose a course of action. So we know we need to pitch for best airspeed, find a field, and do a checklist. And that's part of the identify solutions. You do the actions. You pitch for 65 knots or whatever it happens to be for best glide. You look for a place to land and you aim your airplane in that direction. And then you run through your checklist. And then we evaluate the whole thing and do it all over again. For example, you're holding your airspeed, you're going at your field, but you're too high. Okay, so you're going to extend your downwind. Or you're going to do some S-turns or whatever it happens to be. And you're constantly running through the decide model. I know these models seem like a bunch of information that you don't have to know, that it's like a lot of the soft science-y type of stuff that why should I care about this? But I'm trying to teach you how to think and how to make decisions. That's all it is. You might not say, I'm using the decide model to figure out blah blah blah, but you're running through it in your mind and you at least know what you're looking for. And the way we make aviation decisions is by using all of the available resources we have, rating them best to worst as far as the decision goes, and then picking the best course of action and then constantly reevaluating and seeing if that was the best decision. And if it's not, you go and you try the next best decision. Some of the resources that you have in a single pilot environment are your passengers if you have anybody with. Believe it or not, most people can read you a checklist if you need them to. They can look for traffic, and it could be kind of fun for a passenger actually. Something else that seems kind of funny and weird is talking to yourself or verbal communication. You can talk yourself through what you're doing, especially when you're doing a checklist. You know, landing gear down, and you point at the actual gear flaps set to whatever it is, you point at the flaps or you touch them. That way it's both a visual and a tactical and a mental check that yes, I did do this thing. And when you talk to yourself, you'll actually catch yourself saying something, you know, like 20 seconds later and go, wait a minute, that's probably not right, maybe I should do something else. Something else you might not think about is your system's knowledge. You know the airplane that you're flying, you know how the instruments, how all the equipment, all the avionics and all that stuff works. And you also have checklist and the POH. On the outside of the airplane we have air traffic control and flight service stations and all that information is at your disposal when you're making decisions. One last thing I want to touch on is situational awareness. If you haven't heard this, you will throughout your training. It's one of the most important things in aviation is knowing where you are and where you will be in the near future. There's a saying that if you haven't been where your airplane will be in five minutes, you're behind. In other words, you need to know where you are what your airplane is doing and where that will take you in a couple minutes. 
When you lose situational awareness, it's serious business. A lot of accidents have happened because of a distraction, and the crew or the pilot focus on that distraction enough that they lose the overall big picture of what's going on. So let me give you an example. Say you're in your local traffic pattern and you're doing takeoffs and landings. On one of your takeoffs, the passenger door pops open. <laughs> now, of course, you look over there and it's flopping in the wind and you have to close that door. I mean, the door is open. You can't fly with an open door. So you reach over and try to grab it. Now, you can't quite get it, so you pull your shoulder harness off real quick. You reach over a little bit more. You can grab the handle and you're pulling it, but it's just not shutting. You're trying to work and solve a problem, and of course it's a genuine problem. But, in the meantime, while you're reaching over to the right, you banked the airplane to the right. Maybe it's only 5 degrees or so, but you didn't notice. And you also let go of the back pressure, so you're not climbing anymore on your takeoff. You're turning, and maybe you're level or even descending. And this is close to the ground. Now you can see where this is going, it's not a happy scenario. So do you have to close that door? Not really. I mean, what's going to happen if you don't close the door? Nothing. It'll just flap around and then you'll land, you'll close the door, and you'll continue on your merry way. Losing situational awareness usually happens with a distraction that takes you away from the big picture of what you're trying to do, which is safely fly the airplane. Kind of along the same track as situational awareness is workload. Of course, when you're new, everything feels like it's happening all at once and there's a lot of it and you're not sure what to do because all the information is coming at you really quick and you just can't comprehend it. But as you get more and more experience, you'll realize that you can manage all this workload. You can do a lot of the things before things get stressful and load shed some of that workload. So let's say you're flying in on a cross country and you're going to go and land somewhere. You know that the cruise portion of the flight is kind of uneventful. You're sitting there holding altitude, holding your heading, you're flying, you're maybe looking outside for things. Well, you can do some things in that low workload situation. You can get the weather as you're getting close. You can put in your frequencies for approach or tower or the CTAF. Maybe you can do your descent checklist early. That way, when time comes to enter the traffic pattern, you're not stressed about doing your checklist. You're not stressed about getting the weather. You're not stressed about any of those things because that's already been taken care of, and now your high workload becomes a low workload. So hopefully this tells you a little bit about aeronautical decision-making, and there's a lot more information, trust me, in the P-Hack, so I would highly suggest checking it out, along with the NTSB reports. If you have any questions, or if you think I really screwed something up in the video, please leave that in the box below. And until next time, have fun, fly safe, and always keep learning. See you next time.